Praise God. Um, thank you. I'm going back old school, if you can call this old school. Hey. Thank you. There you go. See, I creature of habit. Praise God. I prefer this. Amen. Um, uh, not that uh, teaching from the book of Revelation, all things will uh, be the, the thing, the catalyst uh, that saves you. For some, it is. So for some, it will be. Um, but I, a thought came to me, um, maybe it was yesterday, the, the day before, and as I was studying several things, um, and not this particular topic or subject, uh, but I was praying for actually individuals, praying for actually some people that attend this congregation. And um, quite frankly, I was, um, I would say maybe alarmed, maybe on the side of being uh, slightly troubled um, and concerned um, for them. Uh, one of the pitfalls of uh, a church that has uh, worship, uh, a worship team and praise team and, and, and preaching and, and things of that nature is that you can become addicted to the feeling And you can get caught up, raptured, if you will, in what's transpiring. Because there is something happening. There is something, I believe, in my opinion, supernatural. I don't believe praise and worship is uh, natural. I believe it's a supernatural thing, or should be. Um, done through natural human beings. Uh, but... I, I get concerned when I see that the Lord can move so mightily on people and uh, people respond to the moving of God on their life inside of a building during a particular gathering or whatever. And you see things transpiring. I mean, I mean, we see some power. We see people fall under the power, and I don't mean to the floor, under the power of God. The move of God and the Holy Ghost moves like he was moving in this place. And, and you can see sometimes God moving on a person's life. Uh, you, you can see the emotional response. I don't believe it's always just emotion. I believe that people respond and they get emotionally wrapped up in that because God is moving on their heart. And you can't move on someone's heart without it being emotional. And it's not this thing that's emotion. But the heart, the inward man, when God moves on the inward man, that stirs up your emotion. And if God is going to move on you, now if, he, if God gets past your, your heart and just go right directly to your spirit, then there may not be any emotion. But chances are we have to open up our hearts to him as well. Or even when he's moving on our spirit, we allow our whole man to, to yield to him. That causes emotion. Period. So, but the problem is, and I want you to hear me. The problem is, we get caught up in the inspiration. I believe that there should be inspiration. But we need to be careful because you can get caught up in the inspiration and even the inspiration of preaching. Because the word, you know, preaching is supposed to, supposed to be inspired. You know, the word is inspired. 
But you can get caught up in the inspiration and not allow God to do what he needs to do in your life because you shut down on teaching. You respond to preaching. I'm not saying you as a collective group. I'm saying we need to watch out for all of us. You respond, we respond to the preaching because it inspires us. But teaching has a different, um, how would I say, uh, purpose. Teaching is not to inspire you, it's to get you moving and doing. Because you can get inspired. I see too many people, they get inspired on, on Sunday evenings or Sunday mornings. They, woo! Inspired. But let me tell you something. You cannot live in God. <laughs> Can't say that other three-letter word. <laughs> Can't live in God and walk in him um, under inspiration. You need word. We need word. We need teaching. We need uh, to be disciplined. That's where discipleship comes in. And that's where teaching comes in. And some people won't move based on teaching. They only move through inspiration. And so, again, I was concerned, uh, really concerned, that uh, when I see uh, people... <laughs> I mean, they get inspired. And, and then you think, okay, this is going to be it in their life. This is going to be the thing. I mean, I, you, I mean they get down on the I mean, weeping, crying, you know, all types of inward fluids coming out, the nostrils, the mouth, and the, the, the eyes. And, oh, my goodness, everything is, I, they doesn't, they, I mean, they just totally overthrown by everything that's going on and you're like man they're going to be completely changed and then there's a call to go out and do some visitation what happens to that inspiration it's not Sunday morning I know it's good <laughs> because it's the truth truth is always good May hurt a little, but it'll help a lot. And uh, so teaching is ever so important. And that's why the Bible talks about, uh, maybe it's about having it, well, it doesn't say it directly, but we need to have a teachable spirit. Not a preachable spirit. Teachable spirit. And uh, a, a disciple is a taught one. One that's taught and take what they are taught and carry it through into action. A disciple is not a preached, uh, uh, a, a one that was preached to. That's the crowd. To receive a good message, all you have to do is to be the crowd. Praise the Lord anyhow. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. Woo, y'all feel that? <laughs> God bless you. That's the truth anyhow. The truth doesn't set you free. It's knowing the truth. Jesus didn't say the truth will set you free. He said, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. If you don't know it, it can't set you free. He can't say, I don't want to hear that. That hurts. And so that's why on Sunday nights, I am bound to teach. And I don't care how much we slow it down. I don't care how much you like the subject matter. If it's Bible, I'm teaching. Well, why are you teaching that? Because it's in the Bible. And you don't have to question me why I'm teaching something that's in the Bible. <laughs> why are you teaching that subject? Because it's a Bible. 
And chances are a lot of people ain't reading it or learning it on, them, on their own. So I have a responsibility. I have a responsibility to teach the Bible. Not to tickle an ear or to preach a fancy sermon. You come on on Sunday mornings, we'll, we'll, we'll probably preach a sermon for you. And not to say we won't ever preach one on Sunday nights. I've been here on Sunday nights and we've preached a few. But that's only when God says this is what you're going to do, you know. So other than that, I study for lessons to teach that, that in a book and we're doing a verse by verse study. Amen. I would, love to, I, I would love to do a verse by verse study on every book of the Bible. If we're here that long. <laughs> Amen. Praise God. So, but anyway, again, not that the book of Revelation is, uh, is the, the book, but, I, you know, you could probably teach any book of the Bible. People, yes, yes. You go preach, teach, teach on the book of Revelation. People look at you cross-eyed. Like it's not a part of the Bible. Why are you teaching that? Because it's in the Bible. Matter of fact, it's the most relevant thing to the church. <laughs> uh, I, well, I should say this. It's the most relevant thing to the church today. Well, well the church is not going to be here. Well, the church is in the book of Revelation. And the church comes back victorious with him. And the church has a responsibility in the last day, even until we rapture, and, and even after we rapture, what we do today is going to affect everyone that's going to be in the tribulation period. Everyone. Why? Because there's going to be an uh, end time harvest before the rapture, and there's going to be a gleaning after the rapture, and that gleaning, we won't be the ones who, who's doing the gleaning, but the work that we're doing now will be the catalyst for everything that happens and everyone that's saved. And so that's why I felt to teach on this, and, I'm, you know, we're halfway through. Well, not halfway, just about halfway. And so, uh, praise the Lord. Amen. So with all that being said, uh, what a wonderful uh, presence of God. And it, he's still here. He hadn't gone anywhere. Amen. God takes on different uh, manifestations and ways. Sometimes God, God moves on a person heavily. You know, we always think when God, God moves on you, got, you're floating like a butterfly and flying all over the place. Sometimes God moves on your mouth. I mean, it's heavy. And... And so we just got to be aware of what God is doing, how he's doing, and just get along with what he's doing. Amen. Praise God. So with all that uh, being said, we left off in uh, Revelation chapter number 9. And uh, we were discussing, and actually I went on through, kind of uh, got ahead of myself, kind of pretty much was just communicating and talking without using... Uh, many of the notes that I have here we were uh, discussing if you can go I guess for why don't we do start at chapter 9 verse 1 and I'm not going to go through the same things I taught um, last week but uh, Revelation chapter 9 is dealing with the fifth and sixth trumpet and uh, these uh, things that transpire in, uh, in numbers of seven. You have seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven vials or bowls. And uh, these are, are not literal seals, literal trumpets, and literal bowls that just fall out of heaven and pour out and blow. You know, it's... it's uh, uh, symbolic of uh, what's transpiring, what God is doing, amen, in the earth. And, uh, and so I, I want to uh, begin there. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fallen, actually would be the, the, the Greek, a star that had fell from heaven into the earth. And to him, him, 
it was a pronoun indicating it wasn't just a physical uh, element in the heavens, but it was actually a being. Uh, this star, which as, as we've mentioned last week, uh, stars represent in the Bible, you can see that in, in the book of Job, actually in the book of Revelation chapter 12, uh, we understand that um, this uh, star can represent these uh, elements uh, a, a, in, the, in the heavens, like the sun, uh, little lights in heaven, which is the balls of fire, or they can represent actually an angel. And here by the, the wording and the language and the context, it's actually a, uh, an angel that fell from heaven and to him was given the key to the bottomless pit. Now that word uh, there, or that uh, statement, uh, bottomless pit, is actually uh, a Greek word that is the abyss. Uh, many translations translate it into the term the abyss. And... Um, and it's actually written, it's, it's not just a translation of abyss, actually the Greek word itself is abyss, A-B-Y-S-S. -S. And so this angel fell and uh, to him was given the, the key or the uh, key always in the Bible represents authority or the right to open or to close, to bind or to loose. Uh, in every scripture, uh, it's, and even obviously, literally and physically, that's what a key represents. But when it relates to spiritual things, when someone is given keys, they are given authority and a right. Uh, and so this fallen angel was given a right, permission, and authority over the abyss. Now, we talked about the abyss uh, uh, because it is uh, in Scripture, it is throughout Scripture. Uh, we find the abyss when Jesus uh, encountered a man that was possessed with a legion of demons. And the demons said, not to torment me. Don't torment us. Jesus said, what is your name? He said, legion, because we are many. And the, the, the demons begged Jesus not to cast them into, now it's in, in English it's translated as the deep. But that word, the deep, they were, they, they were not talking about water. Again, that word, the deep, is actually the same Greek word that you see right here, bottomless pit. It's the abyss. And so the angels knew that their place of torment, their temporary place of torment, right now, for some angels, that place of torment is the abyss, the deep or the bottomless pit. And so these angels, when Jesus confronted them, these fallen angels, they, hadn't, they were not in the abyss. They were on the earth and tormenting people. And so they said, hey, don't, don't, don't torment us. Don't, don't, don't send us to the abyss. Jesus sent them into the swine, and the swine went over the cliff and went into the water, which is not the abyss. The water was the sea. And I personally believe they, those particular demons were bound right there. We find a little later in this chapter, chapter 9, that there are fallen angels that are bound in the river Euphrates. And so we see that angels can be bound in certain areas and habitats. I, I believe there is a, a spiritual bondage. I don't believe an uh, angel can be bound by physical elements. I believe angels are bound by spiritual dominion. And so any angel that's bound, they are, uh, someone speaks the word of God and commands them that they can only go so far. 
And so we have the authority, Jesus say, says, to bind and loose demonic forces right now. And there are places throughout the scripture, uh, the gospels, um, and they had power before they had the Holy Ghost over devils. Much more so once they received the Holy Ghost. But they not only uh, had power, dunamis, they had exousia or exousia, some would say, which is authority. These demonic beings that were in the bottomless pit, uh, they were shut up in the pit. This fallen angel had the authority to rule them. And that's what's taking place here. And to him was given the key to the bottomless pit or the, the access to unlock or open. It could not have been a, a physical, some physical, you know, prison. You, you know, you can't, uh, let's put them in here and shut the door. It wasn't physical. It was a spiritual realm and a spiritual domain that uh, these angels were placed in. Um, and if we look in, uh, again, I don't want to teach some of the stuff that I've already taught, but I do want to go over some. If you look at um, 2 Peter chapter 2, in verse number 4, So a lot of times people wonder where this pit is. You know, people, it, it amazes me how people try to guess and play games with the, with the Bible. And the bottom line is I don't care where the pit is. I don't, I, I don't want to be in there, so why do I care where it is? Where's this bottomless pit? I don't want to know. If God wants me to know, he would tell me where it is. He didn't tell me, so I don't care about where it is. And people get into all sorts of debating contests. And, you know, some believe it's in the center of the earth. It could be. Fine, if that's where it is. I don't, I don't, I, seriously, I don't care if it's in the center of the earth. So, theologically, it could be the center of the earth. I don't know. Others think the bottomless pit is just simply symbolic. I don't believe that. I think it's spiritual. And I believe there can be a spiritual uh, environment or place in the center of the earth because obviously souls go down somewhere, but I still believe it's not the physical thing that holds it down. I don't believe the physical can hold the supernatural. I don't believe that the physical couldn't hold Jesus down. And I don't believe the physical can hold any demon down. Jesus, when he rose, he was able to go through walls. And, and quite frankly, spirits are able to go through walls. How do you think they get in your house? They don't wait till you open the door and fly inside. <laughs> Let me get in now. And when we take, and I know I'm not teaching scripture, but I'm teaching principle. All right, so when we take uh, oil and we go and anoint our thresholds, and uh, if you hadn't done that before, you can think that sounds foolish or whatever, but we've anointed our thresholds plenty of times. You got to watch out for my wife. Well, yeah, you come to the house, it's all dripping all on your head. Like, oh, my good. One time I came, I'm like, everywhere I talk, I'm like, what in the world is going on? I mean, oil everywhere. So, but it's actually taking authority and using our uh, access in the spirit. Because I believe it can go through walls. So why, why are we anointing the, the doors and, and the windows again? Because we think and they're going to come through the door and the window. And you all anoint that and they go through the wall like, huh? <laughs> yeah, right. Like, that's going to keep me out. <laughs> Please. <laughs> you think about it, we do some crazy stuff. <laughs> but you anoint those symbolically and spiritually to say you have no access here. And we use these 
access points as representation because we're not pulling oil on our, all our walls and on our roof. And so we're telling you to keep out. And you have no place in here. And guess what? They have to obey that. Not the physical thing, but the spiritual dominion you took. And so the fallen angels, or some of them, for God spared not the angels that sinned, but cast them down to hell. Now, this word hell is not Hades. And in the Old Testament, Hades is Sheol. In the New Testament, it's translated as, in the Greek, as Hades. And so, uh, you know, because some people want to think the, the devil's all, that they, they, they uh, Satan is, he's in, he's in uh, Hades right now. He's not in Hades. And, and, and he delivered them into chains of darkness to be reserved unto judgment. This word hell, again, is not Hades. It's Gehenna. Uh, oh, I'm sorry. This is actually, Gehenna happens late. This is Tart, Tartar, Tartarus. T-A-R-T-A-R-S, Tartarus which is the deepest place of the abyss. So get that. The Tartarus is the deepest place of the abyss or the bottomless pit. So uh, uh, these uh, demons that fell, not all of them were cast into the bottomless pit. Some of them, like Satan, has access to the earth because it is a place of darkness. The scripture says that uh, they are, he's the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that works uh, in the, or, or actually Ephesians chapter 6, and you can uh, verse number 13. Okay, is it 12 or 14? It's one of those where it talks about the principalities, powers. Thank you. All right, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities. They're the highest powers, first estate powers, against the rulers of what? The darkness of this world. The Fallen angels rule darkness. That's why you're not supposed, supposed to walk in this, according to this world, and walk in spiritual darkness. It's not talking about physical darkness. It's not talking about, okay, we're okay at, uh, uh, when it's 8 o'clock in the morning. But when it's 6, six o'clock, 7 o'clock, let's hurry up and get home because it's going to be dark. The angels, the devils come out, the spirits come out. No, the fallen angels, that they, this, this world is dark. And so some are cast in this darkness. And you can go back to uh, the previous verse, 2 Peter. Some, in chapter 2, verse 4, are, are um, in this darkness of this world, chains of darkness, deliver them into chains of darkness. And some are in the, the uh, darkness and uh, boundaries of the abyss. As you see here. Now, I don't know why the King James translated as hell so it can confuse you to think it's the same place where uh, dead people go who are not saved. But that's just what it is. So anyway, if you can go back to Revelation, back to Revelation chapter uh, 9, verse number 1. We can go ahead and jump to 2. Second, once you go to 1, make sure I'm, I'm finished there, please. Um, and so anyway, again, this uh, abyss uh, is the place where angels go um, or, uh, when, you, when they are bound from this earth. And those demonic beings, the legion, they said, Jesus, uh, don't send us to the abyss. Don't, don't send us there. I don't know why Jesus accommodated them. I don't know why. I mean, he did. He just sent them to the swine. I don't know why he didn't just 
put them in the abyss. But sometimes when I pray, yeah, and I guess it's like that. Sometimes you pray and you cast out a devil. And I pray that I can't, we cast out devils plenty of times, you know, from off a person or in an area or whatever. And you don't always send them to the, you don't always send them to the abyss. But there's sometimes I, I say, I, I, I'm serious. I say, I cast you to the bottomless pit. I cast you to the abyss. Right. Man, you don't come back and torment anybody else. I'm like, why, why don't we send them all there? You know why we don't send them all there? Because we don't have the authority to. If we had the authority to, we would. And what I mean by authority, you don't have the right to send them all to the abyss. If we did, they would all be there. <laughs> and try sending them all to the abyss. If you do, you're going against the word of God because it tells us in the Bible that, uh, that there are, there are going to be de demonic activity and stuff like that on the earth during the tribulation. Furthermore, I guess we can send them all there, but they're going to be loosed at some point. So now we bind them and loose them and do all that. I mean, bind them and everything else. But, uh, you know, when you say uh, authority, you mean you have to have the right. You don't usurp authority. You can only, so when God unctions you or bids you to cast something out and send it to the abyss, you send it. And maybe that's why Jesus put, sent them to the, uh, the swan. Because I know he only did the will of the Father. Through and through. So, this particular angel, fallen angel, was given in the, Rev in the book of Revelation. This angel will be given uh, the access and authority to release. You think it's bad now? You think we're, 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 <laughs> we're fighting now? Imagine, just imagine this. You think it's dark now? And it is dark. This is a dark world we live in. I mean, it, and it's getting darker. Can you imagine when the light of the world, when the church is not here, the restrainer is gone through the rapture, and not only the church is gone, but the demons that are in the abyss are unleashed, to also fight with the demons and work with the demons that are already on the earth? Now you can see why this, this world is going to be like it's going to be during the tribulation period. And that's why I don't want to be here. And I'm not going to be here. And so he opened the bottomless pit, this angel, fallen angel, and there rose a smoke out of the pit. We talked about that as the smoke of a great furnace, and we covered all that, and I'm not going to cover it again. Uh, and again, more darkness on the earth. Uh, I don't, I don't want to st uh, stick on that point. I covered that. So if you can drop to verse number three, please. And I didn't really teach on this the last time. I, uh, let me just say this. I, I love preaching. I love preaching. But I love teaching. And the, the reason why I love teaching because I love the Bible and I love the Word. And I want to know what the Word says. And I, I, I'm always fascinated when, when I learn something from the Word. And uh, uh, just like this morning, it, to me, that was, for me, it was a revelation this morning. Because we take the word, and, you, and when the word is preached, you can take, you can take a, a, any message, anything, and you can preach it, and that still may not be the context. And I know how you can take a scripture, and you can tailor it based on how you feel and all that. And that's a little danger in that sometimes. Because we, and I, I believe the, 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 the word is multifaceted, meaning it can, it can fit. You know, it, it, the word is not like, you know, a square peg fitting into a, a, a round circle, whatever. The word can fit any person, any situation. Amen. The word, the same word can go in your life and impact you in one way and go into somebody else's life and impact them in another way. And that same word can do this thing in one person's life and do another in another's life because the word can be tailored to you to fit you. But the bottom line is this. The word is still in certain, written in certain contexts. And we need to, you know, have contextual in, uh, integrity. 
And so I don't mind preaching a message and using a particular word to preach a message based on a certain vein or a move of the spirit. And I don't mind that. And why it wasn't necessarily written in that facet, but you can use it and use a certain principle out of that word because in one word can have various principles. And you can use a principle, but the bottom line is this. That word was written in a certain context, and we need to make sure we have contextual integrity to say this is what it really means, even though you can apply it in different situations. And so that word this morning to me, uh, you know, was the, really that the scripture is really referring to when it's talking about uh, all, all, all things work together. It wasn't uh, according to what we want and how we want. It's according to God's purpose. And so that's what I mean by context, keeping stuff within context. And that's why I like teaching. Because you get away from all the little trinkets and you stick to what it's actually talking about. So there, and there came out, oh, verse number three, I think I read that all already. Okay, maybe I didn't. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth and unto them was given power as the scorpions of the earth have power. Again, I went into why I believe these locusts are not literal locusts. And uh, I'm going to do that. I'm going to take some time to study that. So this is the reason. And the reason why I'm doing this is because I don't know if you studied the book of Revelation. Uh, I know a lot of you have mentioned that you, you've always wanted to learn the book. It was confusing and, and et cetera. Uh, I'm sure some of you have read the book of Revelation, etc. It's like, man, this is far out there or whatever. So, now there are certain, when you study the book of Revelation or at least begin to and, and you grabbing uh, information from different sources and resources, you see all sorts of uh, interpretations or opinions about what this means, what that means, what this means, what that. And the safest thing is to find out if the Bible has something to say on the subject. And so regardless of what all the uh, people of opinion, commentators, and everyone else has to say, even if they're scholars, I would rather see what the Bible has to say about that particular area. And chances are I'm safer getting something, a, uh, a, um, an interpretation based on Scripture because now I'm letting Scripture interpret Scripture. Because all scriptures is given by inspiration of God. It's not for private interpretation. And so I, if I allow the scriptures to interpret scripture, when there are no other scriptures that uh, communicates on that particular subject in the line, it's just open for speculation. And the safest thing to do is not to speculate, but just say, I don't know. God hadn't said, and I'll wait for him to reveal it. So, but here, I believe, and so, there, there, there are all sorts of saying about what these locusts are. I mean, I've, you've heard, I've heard all sorts of strange things, and some of them are really funny. It, it's it's com comical. I tell you, you, if you want a good laugh, read some of the commentators. I mean, they are clowns, because they really make you laugh. I mean, I, it's funny when you hear some of the stuff. And so, so I don't believe these are, are literal locusts, uh, natural locusts, for several reasons. First of all, they are given authority uh, of scorpions and attack men. Verses 4 and through 6 uh, of the book of Revelation. We'll get through those. They are, I don't the reason why, because they are, have the authority. They were, they were given power or the right as scorpions to attack men. Now, so they have power, authority, and they have whatever they have uh, to, uh, to inflict um, torment to men. I don't know about you, but I've never seen a, a, a locust today that has anything in its anatomy and makeup to attack men. Now, they can attack uh, green things and vegetables and, 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 and stuff like that. They ascend out of the dark smoke from a place where spiritual beings are. These locusts ascend out of the smoke. Now, 
You can take the smoke literally if you want to. I personally don't. I take it as a spiritual thing that's transpiring just like I take the abyss. I, I believe the abyss is a literal place, but it's not a natural place. I believe it's spiritual and supernatural. And because the beings that are held there are spiritual and supernatural. And so even though there's a physical place that may uh, have the place where the beings are, these beings are, are loosed, and they're loosed with the smoke that ascends. So I don't believe these are literal locusts because they come from a spiritual place. They come from, these locusts are coming from the abyss, the deep, the bottomless pit. If the bottomless pit is for devils or fallen devils, what are the locusts doing there? They're, they're neighbors or something? I don't know. Verse number four, please. It was commanded them that they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God on their foreheads. Don't, don't touch anything on there. Well, you say, well, that must be locusts right there. They, they can't touch anything. They, they can't hurt the, the grass or anything that's green, neither any tree. Now, if you look in uh, previous scriptures and passages of scripture, you see that the angels that uh, had the ability to inflict torment and, and destruction on the earth, the, the, one of the things they touched were the, were the green grass. And you find out through the book of Revelation, green grass, trees, and everything, the waters, the oceans, and all that were affected on the earth, and they were affected by angels. That's another reason why. Next, they have a king over them, verse number 9. I think it was verse number 9. Oh, I think it was in uh, chapter, verse 11. There we go, 9-11. So they have a king over them. And the scripture tells us in Proverbs 30 and 27, the locusts don't have a king over them. Never had. Proverbs 30 and 27. Locusts do not have a king over them. They go in bands and bands and bands, but they don't have a king over them. But this particular group of what is called in the, in the book of Revelation, locusts, they have a king. And the Bible doesn't contradict itself. So, what that means, again, is, now if you're going to, that's <laughs> Proverbs 30 and 27. I, I know I'm, 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 I'm spitting them out to you really fast. The locusts have no king, yet they go forth, all of them by bands. And so, because they have a king, it lets us know that these are not literal locusts. Why does the Bible, you say, well, why does the Bible say locusts? Well, there's a lot of things that are written in the book of, the book of Revelation where John could only give a description uh, to represent because, and why do he, does he use locusts? Um, I, I have a whole lot, I, I can't do it tonight because it's, I have a whole lot of scripture. When I, I'm going to send this out next week. I, I give you all the scriptures that deal with what locusts has done throughout scripture. And so when you see the, script, the, 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 the devastation that the locusts caused, these demonic forces are going to cause so much devastation on the earth that that's why it's written in that particular manner. Okay? Uh, just a couple of more. They have a leader that's a fallen angel, verse number 11. You can go back to that. Revelation 9, 11. And they have a fallen angel, and they had a king over them. We already mentioned that. This king is an angel. And he is the angel of the bottomless pit, meaning he's the ruler or the leader of the bottomless pit. Now, if he's the ruler or leader of the bottomless pit, I, you know, I don't know any angel that, that's, that's, <laughs> that's leading insects. 
You don't find that in Scripture. Angels that are king over insects. It's funny, though. I remember years ago I had, we, well, we were at some, some function, and we came out of the house, and uh, this big dog came out. And actually, Brother Milton, we were over your house. We had some event over your house on, on Rooka. Rooka, the rocket, whatever it's called. And we came out, I forget, we had some deal. We came out of the house, and some big dog came out in your yard and everything else. And one of the saints, no, I don't remember which one of the saints. If I did, I wouldn't tell you whatever. And one of the saints said, I bind that spirit. <laughs> She's buying that spirit off that dog. <laughs> I don't think that dog was running around. Uh, no spirit running around controlling it. You know, I'm not saying it's not possible. I, mean, I, I believe it's possible, but my point is because if they can go into a swine, they can go into a dog. But uh, I don't think they're wasting time going into the dog. I think Jesus put them in the, in, in, in the swine, you know. Jesus put them there. So, anyway, moving on along. <laughs> and we know from Scripture that only angels, fallen angels, are said to be confined to the bottomless pit. Right? Only fallen angels are assigned to the bottomless pit. So these can't be locusts. All right. Moving on along. Praise the Lord. So uh, let's go to verse number five and six. Again, I'm teaching. And hopefully you want to know what's going on here. And, and, it, and to them it was given that they should not kill them. Now, hold up. Here we go. Man, if the locusts can kill, they some bad locusts. You know? I had not seen a killer locust yet. I seen killer bees. And, <laughs> and in most cases, scorpions, and the reason why I believe it was talking about comparing the, um, uh, the thing of scorpions, in most cases, the scorpions thing doesn't kill you. In most cases, they don't. They sting you and burn you and everything else, but it, it, they don't normally kill. I mean, it's, it's stinging. It's, it's to I mean, it's painful from what I'm told. I've never been bitten by a scorpion. But in most cases, you can read it and check it out. It normally, normally don't kill you. It, it hurts for a long time. And, and to them, it was given that they should not kill, meaning kill men on the earth, people who didn't have the mark, but they should be tormented five months. Now, again, I, I don't believe that's locusts. Like locusts can tell, that the, you know, okay, y'all got five months. No, you can't, you can't do it in July, only at the end of, end of June. I don't believe that. And, but they should be tormented five months, and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion when it strike of a man. Now you say, well, see, right there, this can't be an angel because this angel, uh, because this, this, this insect or whatever it is, this thing torments people. Now I'm telling you what, I've seen some people attacked by a devil. And if you don't call that torment, I don't know what, <laughs> what it is. The guy that had the legion of demons, that uh, Jesus cast these demons out, that, the Bible says that that man was tormented of these demons. And he would, be throwing, and he would throw himself in the fire. He would cut himself. They would try to lock him and chain him and everything else. And he was a, pretty much a wild man. And so, yes, demons can torment you. And, and they can torment you, and it says like the torment of a scorpion. They say when a scorpion bite, it is painful. Now, we know that the spirit, you, you ever heard of the spirit of infirmity? You ever got sick and you know it's the devil? I remember one time uh, uh, teaching a Bible study. I went to go. It was a lady who was caught in a, uh, a, a, a religion. I'm not going to name the religion. And she was in, in, in this religion. And uh, she wanted to get out of the religion. And she wanted to get out of this religion. And she, you know, we, we got a Bible study with her. And, uh, but we went to the house. And the, and the husband, we knew he was really into it. When we got in the house, it was so dark. I mean, and I'm not talking about all the lights were out. I'm talking about you can feel the darkness. 
And we stepped into the living room. I knew I was in for a battle. I was like, oh, my goodness, it is heavy in here. The husband stepped downstairs, came down, and whatever. We met him, and he was so dark. It was so heavy on him, and I was so glad. I, we began to pray on our breath. He left out of the house. He stormed out of the house. And the whole Bible study, he was gone. He was out of the house. I'm like, thank God, this guy was in. I wasn't scared, but, and, but within 30 minutes of teaching that Bible study, I got so sick. You remember which one I'm talking about? It, it got so sick. I'm in, I'm in the, her, her kitchen, and I'm teaching, and we're on salvation. And we're teaching her about baptism in Jesus' name, the infilling of the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues and everything. And I'm, and I'm, I'm, I'm like 45 minutes into the Bible study, and I'm getting sicker and sicker. I'm talking about sick where you feel like you're about to die. And this thing was torn, and she's praying and everything else, but I was determined. You know what, devil? I'm going to finish this, but I know what you are and who you are. It was a spirit of infirmity that attacked me that said, no, you're not going to have her. And I'm like, she's going to be saved. She's going to be one. Well, guess what? She went down in the name of Jesus Christ. She was filled with the Holy Ghost, speaking in other tongues. I left out of that house sick as a dog and I called Brother Valley and Sister Valley up I said I'm on the way I'm sick as a dog I've been attacked by the enemy y'all were standing in the apartments on, Hoff on uh, Frankfurt Y'all remember, we, I don't know what time of night I got to y'all house. I'm like, come on, let's pray. <laughs> they got to pray. You know, Brother Valley, he not, he's not, he's not going to stop praying. <laughs> I ain't got, he was gone, 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 and I knew it. So I'm like, I'm going to Brother Valley because I know he's not going to stop. <laughs> this thing is all for me. Uh, y'all were gone by that time, Elder bro, Brother uh, Milton, y'all were, y'all, and we were just us, and, and he, he, he was praying, we praying, we all praying and everything else, and I started, it stuff starting to lift. By the time I got home, got situated, everything else, within hours, that thing was gone. So I know it was a torment from a demonic Spirit. And that thing had access, obviously. But we got rid of it. It was a powerful thing, though. I mean, I've never experienced a demon that, that powerful to get a hold of me like that. I mean, I've had him attack me at night, and I tell him, and you know, I'm, ha I'm asleep and everything else, and next thing you can't breathe, you're trying to get out of it, just say, in Jesus' name, and you can't get Jesus out, you can't get the name out, and it's, you ever been there? I've been there before. And I'm like, I, and I'm like, I just want to say Jesus. And, I, and they know I'm sleeping. They try to attack you. You know that's a, a scared uh, devil that he got to wait till you sleep. He's scared of you. He got to get you while you sleep. Don't let him scare you. He's scared of you. Try to get you with your back is turned. He try to get you when you you know when your shirt is over your your head. <laughs> yeah, right. <remember that>? Yeah. <laughs> Y'all know what I'm talking about. I had this guy, but he's about this tall. He bigger than I, he was. I, you know what? I, I weighed 120, 125 when I graduated out of high school. I was 130 pounds. And this guy, he wanted he wanted to jump ball on me. He's like 6'2". I'm like 5'7". He wanted to pound on me. And I'm, I was scared. I was scared. Terrell, you won there? And he had all his boys around. But in the neighborhood I lived in, you're not running. You either fight. You, you go down swinging. So the minute he put his shirt, like, okay, it's something. He's going to take off his shirt. You know how they get to try to be bad. Take off his shirt. He took off his shirt, and I'm scared. I'm like, that is my opportunity. Boom, I'm going at it. And I went at him hard when he had his shirt over his head and he couldn't see. See, that's what the devil, the devil's afraid of you. He knows he can't take you. He knows you have the power over him, and so he waits. Yeah. Why you need to stay on God? Yeah. Yeah. I know I'm not teaching right now, but, you know, that thing... That's how they work. But can you imagine where they are unleashed to torment people for five months 
And the Bible says they're going to strike a man and, and they're going to, people are going to want to die. Next verse. And in those days shall men seek death and shall not find it. That's why I know this is spiritual. That's why I know it's not a, a, a locust jumping all on you. You know, locusts jump on, you try to kill yourself, the locusts holding the knife, man. You know, yo, I can't. You know, you got the gun or whatever, you try to kill yourself, and the locusts like, oh, no, you're not going to, yeah, you can't do that. No. It's not locusts. Men will seek to die and can't find it. Like Saul, King Saul. King Saul, he wanted to die. After he saw his son, Jonathan died. He, wanted, he was trying to die. He even tried to kill himself. And, but remember, he was also uh, tormented by devils. From the time the, uh, the, the Spirit of God left him, the devil would come on him. And so he was attacked by spiritual forces. He was trying to die and could not. I believe those devils wanted to keep that host. And so in those days, men should seek death and shall not find it and shall desire to die and death shall flee from them. And so uh, it, it's bad there. It, it's, it's not a good time. Uh, let's drop down to verse number seven. And the shapes of the locusts were, everybody say like. like. The shape of the locusts was like. This, this word like is uh, likened to is, uh, is a, a, a particular Greek word that's it's, it's, uh, an abstract concept. Meaning, it's not literal. It's abstract. It was like the shape. Now, now has anybody ever seen a... a, a now, and then here we go. Now, watch when you read this. It, it, it can't be literal once you start reading and see this. The shapes of the locusts were like unto horses, prepared unto battle. They were, the shapes were like horses prepared. And so he's, and I'm, I'm going to kind of, I don't want to get too deep into the, to Greek and just kind of be all out there on you. and don't want to do that. Uh, and on their heads were as it were crowns. Not literal crowns, but as it were crowns like gold. And their faces were as the faces of men. Not faces of men, but as the faces of men. Uh, it goes on. Let me, let me just keep going for a little, and then I'm going to maybe teach a little bit and wrap up tonight's session. Uh, verse 8, please. Verse 8. And they had hair as the hair of women, and their teeth were as the teeth of lions. Now, I don't know the last time you've seen a locust with teeth and hair like women and, and, and uh, faces like men and crowns of gold on their hair, head, looking like horses prepared in the battle. And verse number nine, and they had breastplates as were the breastplates of iron and the sound of their wings, where it's the sound of chariots of many horses running to battle. I mean, this is a serious description. Serious description. Now, uh, again, John the Revelator was caught up in the spirit. On the, well, he was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Then he was caught up in the spirit again in another dimension up in the heaven. And he saw things that quite frankly he hadn't seen in his day nor any other person have seen ever. And he was seeing visions. He was seeing 
Like when you get a vision of something, now in this dispensation and time frame, it's not something that's literal. I've had spiritual visions and certain things met something spiritually. A couple of weeks ago, in a, I had a vision of the walls of the enemy had, uh, was crashing and falling down. Now, I don't believe somewhere there were literal, a literal wall, amen, that the enemy had. But it was a spiritual representation. And so you can see things naturally, uh, or, or should I say a natural vision, or it seems natural, physical but it has a spiritual application. And I believe a lot of these things, it's, it's literal. I mean, it's something that's going to happen. But we need to understand what's going on. I don't believe they're real horses and, and, you know, all these things are literal. I believe they were like unto. So John was given, he was, he can only describe something that he knew. So the, he, the closest thing he could relate to, well, you know what, this is it. Now, I, I'll just give you an example. What are those things right there? Uh, gra just grab the things by your legs. What are they? Legs. Their legs? What are those things that you put your arm on? I mean, they call, people call them arms, too, right? right? And, and the arms of a chair and the legs of a chair. I mean, that's not a leg and that's not an arm. We call it a leg and an arm because we use language that we can relate to. Uh, John was using language in his day that he can relate to. I would believe that we probably could, if we saw the things that John saw, we probably could explain it a whole lot better than when he explained it. But he lived 2,000 years ago. And so he could only use things that he was aware of and knew about in his explanation of things. And so uh, he uses this word, uh, the word shapes. They were, when it says that the shapes of the locusts were likened to, the word shapes is actually, I'm, I'm not, I would hose it up. I have it written there for those who, who's going to get, uh, get the notes. Uh, this word is used six times in the New Testament, and it always expresses abstract concepts. So again, that's why it's not literal, uh, physical. It's, it always expressed extra abstract concepts rather than uh, the literal shape. So in Romans 1.23, you don't have to turn there, but you can if you can get there quickly. I'm reading through them. It talks about made like unto corruptible men. It's, it's an abstract thinking. Uh, 1.23, talking about God. Change the, the, the glory of the incorruptible God into an image made in, uh, like unto corruptible men, like unto you. Know, you can't change God into anything. Okay? You can't take God and make him, but, it, but men begin to do that. Okay? In Romans 5, 14, the similitude is the same, it's the same Greek word that's used, the shape. He, it, it's translated as similitude. Somebody uh, sinned after the similitude or didn't sin after the similitude of Adam's transgression. And so, again, this is a conceptual or abstract conception or uh, concept. I'm sorry. It's, it's an abstract concept. It wasn't something literal. In Romans 6, 5, uh, the likeness of his death, Romans 6, 5 talks about our dying out or whatever. The likeness of his death, we shall also uh, also be we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. So if we've been planted together in the likeness of his death, when we were baptized, we were planted in the likeness, or that word, if it was translated in, in, in Revelation, in the shape of his death, and we shall also in the shape of his resurrection. You see, it's not a literal thing. It's, it's a abstract thinking. And so when you read, and I, I have more, but I'm not going to take the time to get into all that. When you read the context of Rev the book of Revelation here in Revelation 9 and 7 and through 10, you'll see that it's, it's talking about something that's abstract. It's not the literal thing. That's why, again, these are not literal 
uh, locust. And I've taken the time for that because, again, you can read through a lot of stuff when you're trying to study the book of Revelation. That's one of the main things that they say. Again, I personally believe, based on everything we've communicated, that these are uh, spiritual beings. Anyway, again, you'll receive the, the notes on, on those uh, coming up. Now, let's drop down to... I'm going to skip through some of these. Let's go to Revelation chapter 9, verse 13. Again, we're doing verse by verse study. And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God. And so this is a, a um, something that's in heaven. It's not referring to something on earth. And uh, this angel sounded, saying, verse number 14, uh, to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, he's speaking to the sixth angel. He heard the voice of, uh, from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. Loose them. Let them go. Again, they are angels that are bound that will be loosed during the tribulation period. And without the church, without the Holy Ghost, this world, now this world want to talk about the church all they want to. They want to push the church down. They want to stop the church. They want to shut the church up. They want to, check, they want to take the power from the church. And the church is the best thing this world has. Don't let them talk you down. You ought to know who you are and what you are. We're the salt of the earth. We're the, we preserve this earth. We keep everything together. We, oh, hallelujah. We're the body of Christ. And they didn't like Jesus Christ when he came in his physical body. And they rejected Jesus Christ when he came in his physical body. They ridiculed Jesus Christ. They did all that. You don't let all that stuff get to you. you don't, and then you don't uh, try to take on the character of the world just because they reject you. When we out there trying to win the world, we don't need to act like them. They rejected our master, our savior, our Lord. Amen. And so... These things that are bound will be loosed for one purpose. And the Bible talks about them being loosed. Now, again, I'm not going to take, I have plenty of notes, and I thought I was going to be done. I thought I was done last week, but I felt that to continue to go over this again. Revelation 9 and 15. Um, so they are loose from the river Euphrates. Now, the river Euphrates is very significant, and I wish I had the time to get into detail, but we find the river Euphrates in the, um, in the garden uh, in the beginning in Genesis, and we see it in the end. It plays a significant role, um, and it actually separates uh, uh, the land, it, it was very significant in, 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 in biblical days for various things. And again, you can read about that here. I'm not going to take the time. Uh, those of you who are, are getting the notes, you can read a little more about that. Uh, so these four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour. Now, that, that, that's mind-boggling, that there are angels that are prepared. It's just like there was a, a great fish that was prepared. God prepared a storm. He prepared a great fish. He prepared a, a gourd, and it was something else that God prepared simply for Jonah, for what he went through. I believe God prepared things for us here right now in our walk, and he's preparing something for us for later. But these things were prepared for one hour. 
a day, a month, a year to kill one third of mankind. And I know I talked about this, this part last, uh, last week. And verse number 16, so I'm not going to talk about that. I want to jump to verse 16, which I didn't talk about. If you can pull that up real quickly or go to the next verse. Very much appreciate it. Thank you very much. And the number of the... Now, he went from talking about the river and uh, these angels which were loose that were bound in the river Euphrates that separated the kings of the east. They were being loosed. And all of a sudden, he jumped from that to slay a third... Uh, a third part of the men on the earth. Now he goes to verse number 16. It says, and the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand, which is 200 million. And I heard the number. So he heard the number. He, he, the number of the army he saw, but then he heard, he didn't count them, but he heard someone say the number or some, something from heaven, say the number. So, this is the scripture that talks about a 200 million man army that uh, is believed that's going to be unleashed from the east because the, during the battle of Armageddon, we get, we'll get into that later, the kings from the east will be unleashed or unloosed or released and they will kill a third of, of men. Verse number 17, I'm, I'm trying to move along quickly. And thus uh, I saw the horses in the vision and them that sat on them. Now these were different. Now, now watch this. The breastplates, they have breastplates of fire, jacinth, uh, brimstone. The heads of the horses were as the heads of lions and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. Brimstone. Obviously, they weren't literal horses. But if, the, if this was an army, this passage was, was an army. Uh, and these armies, we know today that armies are not on literal horses. But these were things that the men rode upon. And um, I, uh, we, can, we can get into... I mean, there's all kinds of stuff out there that people try to say what these, each of these symbols mean, and I, I don't really have the, the time, patience, or uh, imagination <laughs> to try to fit the, the, the description into, into something that we could relate to. All I could tell you that you can see that their army, that their weaponry, weaponry is uh, something of a vast nature, and uh, you can tell that what comes out, fire, smoke, and brimstone, that's very easy to denote uh, today's uh, war, uh, weapons of warfare. Um, whether it's missiles or uh, anything that we use nowadays uh, as far as weapons, gunfire, and everything else, this is a perfect description of that. And so I'm not going to, again, take the time to, to get into that. But what, what I say, this is a full-scale, worldwide uh, war of modern warfare that's going to be going on, that's going to obviously kill, uh, it said one-third of the pop, I'm sorry? Yeah, or a third of the population that's left. That's a lot of people. I mean, we're talking, let's, let's just by way of comparison, we're talking the coronavirus. Does anyone know the number of people the coronavirus killed in the last, over this last year? Y'all not watching the news every, about the coronavirus every? Huh? Worldwide, 244,000? Okay, what's worldwide? Somebody probably can look it up real quick. 200,000 worldwide. I mean, just in America. A million. Thank you, because I did. I saw that today. 1.32 million. Now, 
my, just my personal opinion, this is not gospel. I believe some of those numbers are inflated simply because they, they want to put that on any somebody die, whatever. Hey, COVID, any complications, whatever. Uh, so, but we'll be safe. We'll just say a million just in case some people die from COVID. They said die for something else, but that's, that's not the way it's happening. <laughs> I think they've been on the safe side by saying it was COVID. So anyway, just a million people, one million. In about a year. So at the rate we're going, if it was three years, it would be three million. Right? I'm not saying that's going to happen. In this period, by this one, uh, one um, thing or event that transpires, one third of the population, by one event in five months, well, no, the first thing was five months. This one is through this warfare. So let's just do the comparison. It's 8 billion people, 7 point something billion people on earth. Just say about 8. It's easy to say that. 8 billion people on earth. Well, one-fourth died in the, uh, what was it, the fourth seal. So one-fourth of 8 billion is 2 billion. So you got 6 billion left. So now a third of the 6 billion gives you, that's two, that gives you four billion left. That's half of the population. Half of the population. Four billion people gone in about, now we're going to just, as far as the time frame, of the, about four or five years of time. Four or five years of time compared to four million maybe in four or five years of the epi uh, pandemic that we have right now. Billions? Compared, that's what I'm saying. This is, you, you, and we see this in how, how, how it is impacting people now. Can you imagine during that period? I could not imagine. But that's what's going to happen. That's why I'm so glad he predestined me. I'm so glad he called me. I'm so glad he justified me. I'm so glad he sanctified me. <laughs> Declared me innocent. Where I don't have to be a part of that. Verse number 20, and I'm going to close with this. And the rest of the men. Now, now, y'all were jumping up and down. There's nothing jumping up. You, you know, you ought to jump up and down to say, you know what? I'm not going to be around in the book of Revelation on chapter t uh, 9. I'm, all, I'm in chapter 2. I'm in chapter 3. Chapter 9, no. But we need to pray concerning everything that's going on right now. Bishop Wright is going to be teaching. He's, he already communicated what he's going to be teaching about the the, the last sign before the rapture is going to be talking about the harvest, the end time harvest. Folks, we have a great uh, opportunity and a grave responsibility to be all we can be and all God has called us to be and conforming us to be and transforming us to be right here and right now because this stuff is coming. And it's coming sooner rather than later. And it says, the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet repented not of the works of their hands. You can stand, please. That they should not worship devils. So they were still worshiping devils. And idols of gold. And silver. And brass. And stone. And of wood which neither can see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, verse 21, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their thefts. Even though all this stuff
will transpire on the earth, you will have some people that will refuse to repent and turn to him. Now we can't focus on that. What I do know, there will be a great number of people that will repent. And our focus needs to be on them. God has promised a great harvest of people. And my desire and your desire should be to see as many people as possible not end up in verse number 21 of chapter 9 in the book of Revelation. That's our right. That's our privilege. That's the authority that we have. We need to pray like we've never prayed before. Amen. We need to live in him like we've never lived before. We need to walk in him like we've never lived before. We need to give ourselves wholeheartedly like we've never given ourselves before because this thing is serious. This thing is real. And we can't have that mindset and attitude, well, I'm in the church. Well, I got mine. God, pour out your, the knowledge of you. Pour out, God, your spirit. Pour out the revelation of you. Pour out, God, the love for truth. God, grant repentance. Turn those that have been bound and captive. Set them free. Turn them from their sin. Lord, give them eyes that they can see. Wake them up, oh God. Trouble them in their sleep and in their dreams. God, do everything within your power. Use your people. Thrust us into the field, oh God. Send forth your laborers. Move your church, God. Do everything you need to do in us to use us as instruments, to use us as vessels, conduits. Pour out your spirit, oh God. Receive the harvest, the fruit of the earth. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, God, give us a sense of urgency. God, put upon us your burden, not our own. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, fill us with your passion. And lose a compassion for the lost like never before. Let us see them as you see them. In the name of Jesus. In the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Use us, Father. Prepare us, God. In Jesus' name. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. Amen. I'm looking forward to pause all things apostolic. God has promised a great harvest. And I want to be a part of it, a part of that harvest, a part of the laborers in the harvest. What about you? Amen. Amen. God has given us power and authority to tread on serpents, scorpions, and over all the power of the enemy. And let's use our power for his glory, his name's sake. Let's pray that God will use us. Give us the spirit of evangelism. Ambassadors of Christ. The spirit of prayer. In Jesus' name. God bless you. God bless you. Let's be mindful of those, uh, respectful of those uh, that may desire uh, to have some distancing. And we're going to be mindful of that and respect that. But God bless you. Be safe. We'll see you uh, this week during pause. Amen.